Hello, I'm Bill Lawson, Executive Director of the Mahoning Valley Historical Society, and welcome to this month's edition of Bites and Bits of History, supported by the John and Loretta Hines Foundation. A couple of announcements before we get started. The Arms Family Museum and Tyler History Center sites are still closed to the public due to the pandemic. We will keep you informed about an opening as we plan to do so as soon as it's safely possible. Also, this month we're bringing back our Historic Preservation Awards program and we're looking for nominations for local preservation, conservation, and uh, restoration projects. If you have a project in mind that you'd like to nominate, please see our website www.mahoninghistory.org for more information and a nomination form. Today's program is April 1861, 160 years later, presented by Tracy Manning, our Curator of Education. Tracy holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Religion and Civil War Era Studies from Gettysburg College and a Master of Arts degree in Applied History from Shippensburg University. She also studied secondary social studies education at Wilson College. Tracy worked six years for the National Park Service as an education park ranger before coming to MVHS in 2012. All right, thank you, Bill. Today I'm gonna to be talking about the 160th anniversary of April 1861. But to do that, we're gonna to have to go way back in time uh, to kind of set ourselves up for what happened. So there are two main questions that people ask me about the start of this civil war. Question one, when did it start? And question two, what started it? And some people think that the first question is actually the easy one. They'll say that the Civil War began on April 12th, 1861 at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. They'll also say that the second question is actually the hard one, as it involves politics, economics, states' rights, sectional differences, constitutional analysis, and so on. Well, I'm gonna flip-flop those two thoughts, because the start of the Civil War is not nearly as easy to pin down as its cause. It's single cause, slavery. All of those other categories of states' rights, politics, economics, and so on, all have their roots deeply planted in slavery. It's as simple as that. What isn't as simple is the long and often violent road that this country took to get to an all-out war. Pro-slavery politicians and early abolitionists had been fighting since before the American Revolution, <clears throat> and their conflict continued through the drafting of the Constitution. In the early days of the Republic, Southerners were desperate to hold on to their slaveholding status and the economic benefit slavery provided. Our founding fathers worked out an agreement to allow slavery and, in the end, worked out a system that would further benefit slave owners when it came to population-based representation. Those held in bondage would count as three-fifths of a whole when it came to counting population. So while those human beings were not even considered to be a full person, the benefit of having more enslaved people provided a snowball effect in the power dynamic. There were approximately 990,000 enslaved people in the United States in 1800, but by 1860 there were just over 4 million. Those 60 years saw a number of power grabs and desperate attempts from both sides of the slavery argument. One of the first has become known as the Missouri Compromise. By 1819, the nation was heading west and former territories were coming in to the United States as new states. The Northwest Ordinance banned slavery in the Northwest Territories, the new states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and parts of Minnesota. But the debate over the land in the Louisiana Purchase started a long series of political movements. The political parties of the 18-teens were very different from what we have today. The Federalist Party had basically ceased to exist after the War of 1812, and the Democratic-Republican Party, yes, you heard that right, were the ones in power. Peace and agreements within the party, though, were proving difficult as factions began to distance themselves from other factions. New York Representative James Talmadge proposed an idea that some considered quite radical when it came to slavery in Missouri. He proposed that no more slaves could be brought into the new state and that all enslaved children born after Missouri's statehood would be considered free. 
Known as the Talmadge Amendment, this idea for gradual emancipation in the new state was favored by many in the North, but not because most Northerners were in favor of abolition. In fact, most Northerners had relatively racist outlooks towards African Americans, especially those enslaved. Northern support came because this step would help to ensure that less political power was granted to Southern states, which at this time had a huge advantage because of that three-fifths clause. Those proponents of slavery felt that slavery needed to expand in order for it to survive, meaning that new states must be admitted to the United States as slave-holding states, and thus began that journey towards what we now know as the Missouri Compromise. Southern politicians essentially held Maine's statehood captive, knowing that Maine would come into the United States as a free state. So after a series of congressional debates, behind the scenes work, it was set out that Maine would only be granted statehood as a free state if Missouri was able to come in as a state without the Talmadge Amendment and be granted full slavery with no clauses. As a result, a precedent was set that new states would be permitted into the U.S. in pairs of slave and free in order to maintain sectional balance in both the Senate and with the Electoral College. Eventually, the Democratic-Republican Party would break up with members following Andrew Jackson and his Democratic Party, while those opposed to Jackson pulled away to form the Whig Party, which also fizzled out due to abolition and slavery opinions, and those anti-slavery Whigs formed into the Republican Party. The history of politics would take kind of hours <laughs> to explain, but I will add that other than their names, the modern Republican and Democratic parties share very little with those in the 1860s. So there are really dozens of things <clears throat> we could talk about in those decades of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, like Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831, the Christiana Riot in 1851, the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1855 and Bleeding Kansas that followed, the Dred Scott case, abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison publishing his Liberator newspaper, <clears throat> and then former slaves like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth speaking out for abolition, the Compromise of 1850, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, and of course John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. And it's because of those events, along with many more, <clears throat> that some people find it difficult, including me, to really pin down when the Civil War started. All of these were vital steps on the nation's climb towards that precipice of war. So I'll ask you, did the Civil War start when shots were fired in Virginia by Nat Turner and the dozens of enslaved who fought with him? Or did it start with the violence in Christiana, Pennsylvania? Or maybe it was the actual guerrilla war that broke out on the borders of Kansas where dozens were killed. Or was it in 1856 when South Carolina Representative Preston Brooks took to the United States Senate floor to beat Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner over the head with a cane. Brooks brutally hit Sumner with his metal tip cane over and over again, and Sumner had to be carried away bleeding profusely. Or maybe it was in October of 1859 when John Brown seized the armory in Harpers Ferry, Virginia in an attempt to steal weapons and arm the slaves in the South to lead an uprising against their masters. Brown was cornered in the armory's fire engine house and surrounded by United States Marines, who eventually took him captive. He was found guilty of murder, treason, and conspiring with slaves to incite rebellion. And he was hanged in December of 1859. Now, all of this leads us to 1860, and don't worry, we're going to get to April of 1861 pretty soon. The events of 1860 moved pretty quickly, all of which were leading to the presidential election in November. So fearful were southern states of the possible outcome of this election that some began setting themselves up for secession months before any ballot was cast. Locally, politics are somewhat split. There were those who supported the southern states' desire to leave the Union and others who adamantly supported slavery. So much so that a newspaper published out of Columbus called The Crisis ran a full-page story about how slavery was a physical, moral, and religious right. The article ended with the following condemnation of religious leaders who supported abolition. And I quote, If ministers choose hereafter to preach abolition, let them do so but let them not pretend to be Christians. 
The minister who pretends to believe the Bible and is yet an abolitionist is a most unmitigated hypocrite. And that was published out of Columbus. Now, fortunately, those voices who supported slavery and Southern sectional politics were not nearly as loud as those who supported the Union and, to an extent, abolition. The Anti-Slavery Bugle, a major abolitionist newspaper published out of Salem, was a leading voice in that argument, and it ran several powerful stories each week. Most other newspapers around here were somewhere in the middle, running news stories as developments happened. In January of 1860, Alabama issued an official platform in response to fears that slavery's continued expansion into the West would be stopped. And this platform stated, among many other things, resolved further that we reaffirm so much of the first resolution of the platform adopted in convention by the democracy of this state on the 8th of January, 1856, as relates to the sub subject of slavery, to wit, the unqualified right of the people of the slaveholding states to the protection of their property in the states, in the territories, and in the wilderness in which territorial governments are as yet unorganized. So that's in January of 1860. They're already setting themselves up to secede. In February, Abraham Lincoln, who had already burst onto the scene, delivered a vital speech at the Cooper Union in New York City. This speech proved to be a sort of introduction of Lincoln to the audience here in the East. In it, Lincoln argues against allowing the spread of slavery into the Western territories, and it includes that famous closing line, let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. This speech further pushed Lincoln into the spotlight and fully aligned his party with the stance that slavery should not be allowed to spread any further. This prompted the party to nominate Lincoln as their candidate for president. Meanwhile, the Democratic Convention opened in South Carolina. So split was the party over the sectional issue of slavery that they ended up splitting in half, forming a Southern Democratic Party that nominated John Breckinridge and a Northern Democratic Party which nominated Stephen A. Douglas. The Constitutional Union Party nominated John Bell. This third, or really fourth, party didn't have a ton of influence on the outcome, but it is my favorite part of my favorite political cartoon from the era. Here we have all four candidates fighting over the US. Lincoln and Douglas are out west, fighting over slavery's expansion. Breckinridge is literally ripping the South off the map, and poor Bell is up on a ladder with a small jar of glue, just trying to put it all back together again. Locally, Lincoln's going to win the election with very little competition. <clears throat> in Columbiana County, Lincoln received about 4,000 votes, with Douglas coming in just over 2,100. In Trumbull County, the margin was even greater. Lincoln took 4,300 votes to Douglas's 1,600. And here in Mahoning County, Lincoln won by 2,900 to Douglas's 1,900. Votes for Breckenridge and Bell were incredibly low, sometimes less than 100 votes in each county. And in the end, Lincoln wins the nation by a pretty good margin, even though his name isn't even on most Southern ballots. Southerners were terrified of his anti-slavery opinions, and several states began taking official steps towards secession from the United States. By December 20th, 1860, South Carolina was the first state to do just that. In South Carolina's own words, here are their thoughts leading up to Lincoln's inauguration. On the 4th of March next, this party will take possession of the government. It has announced that the South shall be excluded from the common territory, that the judicial tribunals shall be made sectional, and that a war must be waged against slavery until it shall cease throughout the United States. The guarantees of the Constitution will then no longer exist. The equal rights of the states will be lost. The slaveholding states will no longer have the power of self-government or self-protection, and the federal government will have become their enemy. Sectional interest and animosity will deepen the irritation, and all hope of remedy is rendered in vain. By the fact that public opinion at the North has invested a great political error with the sanction of more erroneous religious belief. We, therefore, the people of South Carolina, by our delegates and convention assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, have solemnly declared that the union heretofore existing between this state and other states of North America is dissolved, 
and that the state of South Carolina has resumed her, pin, her position among the nations of the world as a separate and independent state with full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. So South Carolina is followed by six more slaveholding states, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, with four others on the verge of doing the same, North Carolina, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Virginia. And to those who question why these states left and what spurred their willingness to war, let's just take it from them in their own words. In Georgia, they say, the people of Georgia, having dissolved their political connection with the government of the United States of America, present to their confederates and the world the cause which have led to the separation. For the last 10 years, we have had numerous and serious causes of complaint against our non-slaveholding confederate states which reference to the subject of Afri African slavery. They have endeavored to weaken our security, to disturb our domestic peace and tranquility, and persistently refused to comply with their express constitutional obligations to us in reference of that property. And by the use of their power in the federal government have striven to deprive us of an equal enjoyment of the common territories of the Republic. Now in Mississippi, their statement's gonna have somewhat of a biological reasoning. And here's what they say. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product with, which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of the commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate, verging on tropical regions. And by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to that tropical sun. These products have become necessities of the world. And a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. That blow has long been aimed at the institution and was at the point of reaching, reaching its consummation. There was no choice left us but submission to the mandates of abolition or a dissolution of the union, whose principles have been subver subverted to work out our ruin that we do not overstate the dangers to our institution, a reference to a few facts will sufficiently prove. In Texas, that same religious argument about the divine right of slavery was mentioned. And Texas has to say, we hold undeniable that these governments of the various states and of the Confederacy itself were established ex exclusively by the white race for themselves and their posterity and that the African race had no agency in their establishment, that they were rightfully held and regarded as inferior and dependent race. And in that condition, only could their existence in this, com this country be rendered beneficial or tolerable. That in this free government, all white men are and of right ought to be entitled to equal civil and political rights that the servitude of the African race as existing in these states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free, and as, excuse me, and as is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind and revealed the will of the almighty creator as recognized by all Christian nations, while the destruction of the existing relations between the two races as advocated by our sectional enemies would bring inevitable calamities upon both and desolation among the 15 slaveholding states. So that's in their own words, what these states were saying in order to secede. Now secession was born in South Carolina, specifically in Charleston, a center of slave trade, and for decades, the sort of picturesque view of what the Southern lifestyle was, with its mansions and wealthy slave owners and commerce in a very active harbor. But the citizens of Charleston and of South Carolina as a whole were furious, and their tempers were really flared in those early months of 1860, especially after movements by United States soldiers at Fort Moultrie, and their movement from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter. Now, the Charleston Harbor is home to three federal ports, Castle Pinckney, which was just about a mile south of the city's battery, which is a defensive artillery position, Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island, which was heavily armored, and then Fort Sumter smack in the middle of the harbor. Major Robert Anderson was in command of a small garrison, only about 90 soldiers, who defended Fort Moultrie, but the guns are pointed towards the sea, and they had very little defense against any land attack. 
So back on December 26th of 1860, Anderson moves his men essentially under the cover of darkness to the more easily defendable Fort Sumter. Supplies at the waterlocked fort, though, are dwindling, and on January 5th, 1861, a supply ship was sent from New York into the Charleston Harbor. But cadets from the Citadel fired upon the ship, which forced the crew to abandon its mission without delivering any supplies. By February 1861, the seceding southern states met in convention in Montgomery, Alabama to create a Confederate constitution and named Jefferson Davis as their provisional president. On March 1st, Davis orders Brigadier General Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard, and yeah, you have to say that in a horrible French accent. Uh, so he orders Beauregard to take command of these new and growing southern forces in Charleston. March 4th, 1860, marked Lincoln's first inauguration. Lincoln spoke openly about his position to not stop slavery in the states where it already existed but he denounced secession and hoped that the crisis would be solved without war. He closed the speech with the following. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Now, things remain tense until Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens speaks on March 21st, 1861, in what is now known as the Cornerstone Speech. Stevens speaks of the reasons why this revolutionary war, as he thought of it, was coming. His speech defended slavery and the opinion of racial superiority, and he states, but not to be tedious in enumerating the numerous changes for the better, allow me to, to allude to one other, though last, not least. The new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, African slavery, as it exists among us the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. Now, in response to the idea of equality, he states the following. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history upon, of the world based upon this great physical, philo philosophical, and moral truth. Now, all of this finally brings us to April. I told you guys we would get there. The country is no longer on the precipice of what was become. We had taken a giant step off that cliff and plummeted down four years of bloody, horrific war. On April 4th, Lincoln makes it known that he intends to get supplies to those soldiers still hunkered down at Fort Sumter. South Carolinians, though, would have nothing to do with that. And the Charleston Mercury, its main newspaper, said the following. Now the issue of battle is to be forced upon us. We will meet the invader, and the god of battles must decide the issue between the hostile hirelings of abolition, hate, and northern tyranny. On April 5th, Davis tells Beauregard to strike a blow, and he sends three aides to the island to meet with Anderson and ask for his peaceful surrender. Anderson seems to appreciate the courtesy shown, but refuses, stating, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication demanding the evacuation of this fort, and to say in reply thereto that it is a demand with which I regret that my sense of honor and of my obligations to my government prevent my compliance. Anderson also states, though, that his men only have enough supplies to last another 10 days until April 15th. A few more tense days pass before April 12th, when an early morning mortar shot flies into the air and explodes over the fort. 
This signaled the start of an artillery bombardment from Confederate forces on the land and on floating batteries around the fort. A few hours after that start, Anderson responded, but the fight was incredibly unbalanced. In a rather poetic moment, a shell struck the flagpole of Fort Sumper, Sumter, and the American colors fell, only to be hoisted back up the hastily repaired flagpole. 36 hours pass, and with no more resources, Anderson is forced to surrender Fort Sumter to those Confederate forces on April 14th. The battle had only two casualties when an artillery round exploded prematurely, killing two Union soldiers. It was then that the new Confederate flag was raised over the former Federal fort. Now, both Anderson and Beauregard are hailed as heroes, one for his bravery in not surrendering easily, and the other for finally striking a blow against the North. The following day, April 15th, Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteer soldiers to join in the quell, uh, to join in the fight to quell the rebellion, and we'll go back to that in just a bit. And this sparked the states of Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee to join in secession um, with these new Confederate states. Virginia also voted to secede, but I want to take some time to talk about the events which surrounded that decision and greatly impacted the years to come. Virginia's path to secession had been a long one, uh, but the final vote was not official until April 17th. In fact, previous votes had actually gone in favor of Virginia remaining in the Union. But of course, all that changes after Fort Sumter. On April 18th, Virginia militia march on the already famous industrial town of Harpers Ferry, home to both the United States Armory, consisting of more than 20 factory buildings, and its arsenal, home to thousands of military weapons. The armory and arsenal were under the protection of Lo Union Lieutenant Roger Jones. These were federal sites, of course, and thus under the control of the United States Army. Rumors were coming in that the militia forces were on their way and they numbered well into the thousands, which meant that Jones and his men were gonna be heavily outnumbered. Instead of surrendering his men, and more importantly, the weapons and machinery, into the hands of the Southern militia, the soldiers set fire to the factory and warehouse buildings. Their plan was simple, to destroy everything before the militia arrived. Their efforts destroyed little over 15,000 weapons before they retreated across the Potomac River into Maryland. Now, the townspeople of Harpers Ferry joined the arriving militia to put out the fires. And in the end, the damage really wasn't that bad. About 4,000 weapons were salvaged, and more importantly, most of the machinery was saved and dragged from the buildings. Just 10 days later, new Confederate colonel arrived in Harpers Ferry to take control of the removal of the machinery, all of which was placed on trains for Richmond and Fayetteville, North Carolina, where they were used to make weapons for the new Confederate Army and that Confederate colonel, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, just a few months away from earning his nickname, Stonewall. By this point, many important pieces of the war are already in place, including the blockade of southern ports by the US Navy. This set in motion one of the early Union war plans, known as the Anaconda Plan. The idea was to choke the South of any and all connections to the outside world, cutting off much needed supplies. The blockade, its initial step, eventually covered the entire southern coastline with 69 ships, a fleet that will grow to nearly 300 by the end of the war. A well, another well-known piece is the man who will eventually control the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee. He had already declined an offer to command all Union forces, owing his allegiance to his home state of Virginia. And on April 23rd, he took command of those Virginia soldiers. Now the question of those four remaining slave states, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and Missouri, is one that still remains a bit complicated. These slave states never did secede to join the Confederacy, and soldiers from those states fought on both sides of the conflict. Maryland's remaining in the Union was vital to the safety of Washington, D.C. It was already separated from the Confederacy by only the Potomac River, and had Maryland seceded, it would have been isolated in enemy territory. In 1863, these states were joined by the new state of West Virginia, a region of Virginia that never really went along with slavery um, in the overall Commonwealth of Virginia. Now locally, politics, like I said before, kind of business as usual, in the days leading up to the firing on Fort Sumter. There were those who felt sympathy towards the South and ardently spoke out in support for its secession. But as, as it became clear that the war was officially upon them, most here in the Mahoning Valley took Lincoln's call for volunteers to heart 
and support for the union was overwhelming. Locally, politics was basically business as usual in the days leading up to the firing on Fort Sumter. There were those who felt sympathy towards the South and ardently spoke out in support for its secession. But as it became clear that the war was officially upon them, most in the Mahoning Valley took Lincoln's call for volunteers to heart, and support for the Union was overwhelming. On April 17th, the Western Reserve Chronicle out of Warren published a rather bold critique of the seceding states. And here's what that article said. What the people think of traitors. The citizens of this section are law-abiding people, but we could see and hear enough on the streets of our town yesterday to fully convince us that neither among the Democrats or Republicans is there a sympathy with treason or its supporters. The compressed lips and stern looks which the faces of the masses wore, who surrounded one or two advocates of treason there, boded no good to them. There are a few men here, thank God there are very few, who not only express sympathy with the Southern rebels, but avow their hopes that the flag of their country may again and again be trampled in the dust. There is no middle course. Those who are not for the Constitution and the laws are against them. And we have seen enough to convince us that the day is not far in the distance when the air of free Ohio will not be healthy for traitors to breathe. By April 24th, most people here in the Mahoney Valley were fired up in their support for both the Union and the war. The Western Reserve Chronicle again ran an article about that feeling with the opening line, and I love this one, the cool, quiet people of the reserve are fully aroused at last. And it continued, the news of the siege and the fall of Fort Sumter, of the call for troops by the president, of the shooting down in cold blood of loyal troops passing quietly through Baltimore under orders of the government, the burning of bridges, stopping of railroad trains, and at last, the imminent danger of Washington City following close upon the heels of the rest, have stirred the blood of every man who has a spark of honor in him. Neither blood nor treasure will be wanting when the hour of trial comes. Both will be poured out as free as water to preserve the government of our fatherland. The following day, April 25th, citizens met in Warren for a union meeting to discuss the war and the support was immense. At the meeting and at other union meetings throughout the region was local lawyer David Todd, who was coming back on the political scene with an upcoming, upcoming run to be the governor of Ohio. In a meeting held right here in Youngstown, the Mahoning Register reported, Honorable David Todd then addressed the meeting in a speech replete with eloquent thought and patriotic devotion to the common country. He thought the present no time to indulge in party recrimination. Our flag, country, and firesides are all in peril. Political organizations should be lost sight of before the fact that government was menaced by an enemy pledged to disrupt its peace, seize upon the federal capital, and dishonor our na national ensign. The president has done only what his oath required of him, and it is the duty of the people to sustain him when he calls for support, as readily as though Andrew Jackson had made the demand. He hoped that Mahoning County would not be found backward in its appeal for men and means to sustain the executive in this hour of peril. Now, I love that they also add that the speech was frequently interrupted by bursts of applause, and they close the article with the following. Just like David Todd, his heart is as big as a meeting house. Now, Ohio loudly answers the call for Lincoln, uh, for Lincoln's call for volunteers, with more than 310,000 Ohio soldiers serving during the war, plus another 5,000 African Americans who served in the United States Colored Troops. The men who were the first to enlist had no idea what they were in for. Really, no one did. Some thought it would be a swift victory for the North, with men home for the fall harvest. No one expected that the war would last a full four years and take the lives of over 620,000 soldiers and result in the freedom of nearly four million enslaved African Americans. Our path to war started before the ink even dried on the U.S. Constitution. The 72 years between it and the firing on Fort Sumter were filled with sectional tension, political compromise, and violence in the name of each side's belief. Now I'm going to close today with a speech that happened four years later. This is on the date of Lincoln's second inauguration, and he spoke eloquently as ever. Looking back, he summarized those feelings as the nation stood on the brink of war. And he says, On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. 
all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in this city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. So thank you guys for joining me on how this country got itself to April of 1861 and how the Civil War finally started. Um, probably over the next four years, we'll be looking back at the events of the Civil War. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us today. Join us for next month's program, The History of the Youngstown YMCAs, with Leah Merritt, President and CEO of YWCA Mahoning Valley. The premiere will be Thursday, May 15th.